Hey everybody, my name is Sharon Quinn and I'm also known as the original Runway Diva and you are watching Model Behavior. Class is officially in session. My guest lecturer today is fashion industry icon and pioneer Tracy Gail Norman. Tracy made history as the first transgendered model to appear on a Clairol ad campaign. Her story is one of the most inspiring that I've heard in a long time and it is an absolute pleasure for me to welcome Tracy Norman to model behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for being here. Um, I'm gonna jump right into it. You okay. know, we teach here, but I wanna talk about your story, and I wanna talk about, let's go back to the beginning. How did it start for you? Uh, modeling? Yes. Um, it started because I was at the, um, in the wrong place at the right time, and I came in on a model casting call for Italian Vogue, and I was interviewed by the photographer, who I didn't know at the time, of course, mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> and I found out later that his name was Irving Penn and two days later I received a phone call that I was booked to do um, a two spread layout for Italian Vogue and the photographer was Irving Penn. Oh, now what's, what, what size were you when, you when you got started? When I got started I was at least a, between a 10 and a 12. Did you have to lose weight? Yes. I had to lose weight. When I got with the agency, uh, they put me on a diet, and so I got down to a size six, and then they started sending me around, and I was working for catalogs. I was flying all over the place. I was going to um, Florida to shoot for iMagnum. I was going to Chicago to shoot catalogs there. I was going out to Vegas and shooting catalogs there. So they were sending me out on the word that um, the new girl was in town, and she was discovered by Irving Penn. And what agency were you signed with then? Zoli Management. Wow. Now, Zoli was big in the 70s. Yes, Zoli yeah. was really huge, which I um, had a great time with. But they were going to do this campaign. And the campaign, they were promoting me as the young Beverly Johnson. That's really? What they were, yes, that's what they were promoting me as. They, for some reason, Mr. Penn didn't want his name attached to the discovery, but the industry knew that he discovered me. So they were promoting me as the young Beverly Johnson. Now how did that make you feel to be, because I personally have an issue with anybody being another version of somebody else, but I'm, I'm sure that must have been a, a, a huge compliment to you back then. Uh, it was a huge compliment, but in, in my um, green friend of thought, <laughs> I would say, no, I look like my mom. Okay. <laughs> but I understood shortly mm -hmm. what the industry was doing. So, um, and because my career from Mr. Penn's word of mouth and um, him telling me on the set that if I lose a lot of weight, I can make a lot of money, that um, my career started taking off. Yes, as you know... <laughs> Even now, it, that's hard for, some, for that to happen. That's just, that's divine intervention right there because there are chicks that don't, they work for years and they don't get the yeah. sort of door opening that you got. It was a blessing. And then you worked steadily for a, a good while after yes, that, right? Yes, I worked steadily for about maybe a good two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And with that, I was able to sign a contract with Clairol. I went on, it was, it started out as a test. Mm -hmm. And so I showed up and they had, of course, makeup and hair people there and they sat me in a chair and the photographer was taking photos and they chose my photo. And, um, and so I was on the Clairol box. I was box 512, dark <laughs> or burn. <laughs> now, um, Let's fast forward to the day that everything stopped. Okay. Talk about that day. Well, I had been on a set, and prior to me being on the set this time, I had worked for a black publication, Essence Magazine. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was my second booking. And it was a holiday issue. So when I was on the set, they were doing beauty shots of me. And when a client wants a specific character to come out of me, mm -hmm. I have a tendency to get tunnel vision. So 
I was shooting, 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 shooting. Everything was going well. I was being praised by the editor and the photographer and everybody in the room. They loved what I was doing. And so suddenly, someone came in the door on the left side of the room. And as soon as that person walked in the door, the whole vibe in the room changed. It just felt very negative to me. Mm -hmm. And the left side of my tunnel vision disappeared. So that person called over the editor. They had a conversation and I lost concentration and the photographer knew that I had did. He noticed. So he asked me to rest. And so when I rest, I happened to look to my left to see who it was. And it was a hairdresser that I worked with prior to um, my first booking mm -hmm. with Essence Magazine. And somehow, some way, he was behind the scene doing detective work, asking questions because a few years later, I got the word that, you know, this person was being asked, that person was being asked, and everybody that was being asked were friends of mine back in New Jersey, mm -hmm. my hometown. And the hatred that happened changed my life. So I was blessed with this opportunity, and then working with a, a African American publication and being part of the gay community, mm -hmm. the hairdresser. So that was like a double whammy for me. And um, uh, yes, so hatred stepped in and my work stopped. The hell do you get from that? Ruining, so trying to ruin somebody else's life. I don't, was, this wasn't a friend of yours. This was just somebody you knew. This was um, somebody that I met um, on my first booking. And I didn't know him personally. But for some reason, um, because I'm from New Jersey and I believed he lived in New Jersey, maybe not in Newark because that's where I'm from, mm -hmm. um, he knew certain people that I knew. And so he was asking me all of these questions. And I denied knowing these people because that's what I was told to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would just do my work, go home, mind my business. And that's how I worked. And there's nothing wrong with that. And you should have been able to have a long and glorious career because that's how you, you work. Right. But I just, I don't understand people's energy is about doing that. Well, being, being from the gay community and him also being from the gay community, um, we weren't called transgenders back then. We were called more negative and hateful words back then. If, you, if I was to get detected, um, I would be called, yo, that's a dude, yo, that's an effing man, yo, whatever. Um, that was rare back then, you know, being young. But you know, and it brings to mind, because I remember, um, uh, what's her name, Dr. Renee Richards? Yes. And, I mean, she caught a lot of flack, too. Yes. And I've seen her, we had the same uh, eye doctor for a minute. She ain't nearly as fashionable as you are. Um, but for whatever reason, she didn't get all of that stuff that that you got, and I it, it makes me think if that it makes me think that that's a for lack of a better word a black thing yes. that we do that to one another. That's yes. disgusting to me. It was, and because of that, um, <clears throat> I had went into a very deep depression for a cup for a few years, not knowing that I was depressed. That's the thing about depression; you don't know. And me still being young, I had no idea that I was um, depressed. I just um, um, retired, so to speak, and stayed to myself. So with that, um, I met a friend by the name of Douglas Says, and he was slowly bringing me out of this depression that I didn't know I was in, and I don't believe that he knew that I was in, but mm -hmm. he was able to put a smile back on my face because he, he is very funny. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Douglas. <laughs> yes. And um, so with that, um, he encouraged me to go out. He started dressing me in his clothes and I became his muse and um, started doing advertising work for him mm -hmm. and um, doing his fashion shows, etc. And then at some point, um, I ran into a girlfriend of mine by the name of Sherry Gordon, mm -hmm. and she said that she was going to Paris and would I want to come? So we did. We took um, the TWA, a standby ticket, took us three days to get on the plane. 
<laughs> and we had about maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars between the two of us. So we got a hotel room. Um, uh, our dear friend Tommy was there, and uh, we called him. He joined us because we had a suite. And so I got a suite with a hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, but it was cheap back then. Right, right. I'm, I got to think about the times. Yeah, okay. it's the late seventies. <laughs> it was real cheap. So he had a room. Sherry and I uh, shared a bed, and um, it was a little struggle for a while, mm -hmm. you know, for like a few months. And then Tommy and I lucked up and got a job with a jazz singer by the name of Lavelle, mm -hmm. and we did background vocals on her uh, new album that was coming out, and she was signed with Sony in Paris. Wow. And so we did that and then she asked us to tour with her around Paris because she was promoting and doing live shows. So we did that for a while. And then um, I got a phone call one day that um, someone was looking for a, a model that used to live in the flat that I was renting at the time with this uh, dancer. And uh, I asked her, did she, was she looking for a model? Because I was a model. Mm -hmm. And so she said, yes, could I come in for a fitting and an interview? I said, well, I have a previous engagement right now, but my, um, I'll be free in two weeks. Would that be okay? So she said, yes. So I literally wrapped myself up in cellophane from my knees. This is no lie. From my knees all the way up to my breast because being in Paris and not working, you have a tendency to, you know, eat. <laughs> <laughs> and our favorite meal, which the only meal that we could afford was this um, palm frites sandwich. It was a long hero with uh, french fries stuffed in it with um, Arabic mustard on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it only cost six francs. So we, that's what we ate, and we cut it three ways. That sounds delicious, <laughs> but a whole diet of that? Well, that was, so I had to get my weight down, so I did that, and I walked around the whole city of Paris, so I got to know Paris pretty well, mm -hmm. and got my landmark, so I never got lost again. And um, I just drank water, hot tea, and popcorn. But you did it. I did it, I got down to a size four. When I went into the fitting, this was a trip because when I went into the fitting, she brought me into the uh, showroom and um, had me try on uh, a leather skirt, pencil thin, a silk blouse that wrapped around a few times and then you tied in a big bow, and a tweed jacket. Now the skirt, I was still a little hippie even though I was a, a size four, but I was a six on the bottom. <laughs> So she had left the room, thank God, and I literally laid down on the floor and wiggled into the skirt. So when she came back, I tucked the blouse in. She was perched. And I tucked the blouse in, and I asked her, could she help me and zip me up? So I sucked it all in, <laughs> and she said, zip. And um, then I went in and saw the, um, the designer at the time and uh, modeled for him. And he liked me, and I got signed for six months. And who, who was the, the designer? I just remember his first name. I'm bad at names, and it's been 100 years, so uh, his first name was Michelle. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Uh, this is fascinating to me. <laughs> now, let's go back even further. Let's okay. take it back to the beginning. Okay. Did you know from the beginning that you were female? Uh, yes, I believe ever since that I can, far back as I can remember, at the age of three, my I'm three years older than my sister, she was an infant, and my mother got all of these toys for her, dolls, etc. And I played with everything that my mother bought for her. So he was like, I bumped this with, truck. I don't want to play with this. Uh, uh -uh. <laughs> my my father brought me trucks and boxing gloves and the whole <laughs> nine, and the whole nine, but I just wasn't having it. Um, so yes, I started playing with uh, the dolls and I was walking around in my mother's heels. And at the time, my father pay, uh, paid it no mind because it, to him, he said, well, this is what males go through at that young age, you know. But um, this was a phase that I was going through. I guess I kept that phase up. Mm. 
<laughs> did he um, did he have a hard time with it once he realized that it wasn't a phase? Yeah, he had a very hard time. And then when my mother um, and I got my mother, not and I, but when my mother and he got a divorce, we've never seen him again. Wow, how long how long a period was it before? I believe I was around um, five or six years old when my um, mother and father separated. Uh, separated and got divorced. And you knew at five six mm -hmm. that you were in the wrong gender. Yes. And when your father left, did he know that about you? Or is this something that came later no, on? No, I think that what I think he left because of whatever my mom and him were going through at the time. Right, right. That, that's not what I meant. Yeah, because when parents separate, eh, it never has anything to do with the child most of the time. Mm -hmm. But um, so did you have a relationship with your dad after you, you went through the what's the word? Gender reassignment surgery? Is that what it no. is? No, I didn't have a relationship before the surgery or after oh. or whatever. I didn't have a relationship doing growing up. I didn't have a relationship going through um, grammar school, junior high school, or high school. Oh, I didn't have a relationship sorry. with him at all. But I didn't miss it. My, why, why do you say that? I just didn't. I had my mom. I had my mother. And your mom was your rock. My mom, she was everything for me. <laughs> um, so you, did you make peace with your dad? Uh, yes, I had saw him one time on, he was a Newark City bus driver. I got on the uh, bus going into New York one day and um, I said hi to him and he said hi back. Oh, and then he said, oh, how you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. I haven't seen you in a while. He, uh, so I said, um, Daddy, it's me. And he threw his hands up. <laughs> He's driving and he threw his hands up and said, oh. <laughs> How you been? And was rattling off. And I said, I'm fine. So um, I rode to Penn Station, got on the train, and that was the last time. The next time I saw him, he was ill. Oh. Yeah, he was in the hospital. He had cancer. And uh, my mom and I went to see him. And my mother asked, um, uh, do you know who this person is? Do you know who you're talking to? And he said, yes, my oldest daughter. Wow. So he reconciled. I'm glad to hear that. I went through a similar story with my own dad because I'm stubborn and I'm just like him. <laughs> so we didn't talk for a long time. But the next, the, one of the last times I saw him, it was very clear to me that something mm -hmm. was wrong with him. And we reconnected. And, but you realize that you waste a lot of time on foolishness. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, I don't know what your dad was thinking, but I bet that that's what he was thinking because he missed, all, he missed her entire life. Yeah, he missed my entire life, but the strangest thing is that I didn't care. I don't know why I didn't care. I can't explain it, but I didn't miss him. I didn't care if I saw him or not. I was very close with um, my grandparents, his mother and mm -hmm. father, and I saw them frequently. Wow. That, mm. Now, how's your sister? You, know, you have a sister, right? Yeah, I have a younger sister. She's three years younger than I. How do you guys... Well, she, we have a sister-sister thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have our ups and our downs. But you can be yourself at all times. Your sister, right? I was myself at all times. See, this is what I like about you, because you, you, you walk in your truth no matter what. This is what I think <laughs> about you. Now, you're also a makeup artist, right? Yes, I was doing makeup for uh, Douglas. And I helped him backstage. Um, when I'm not doing his shows, as I got older, I stopped doing his shows. Mm -hmm. And so I would do makeup for him and do uh, photo shoots for him. I would be behind the scenes. I was enjoying that, styling and doing makeup and hair. So I was enjoying that a lot. But I also um, landed a job with, um, I was a manager of a shoe store mm -hmm. in Soho. We had two stores, so I was floating back and forth to the um, Park Avenue uh, store, uh, Madison Avenue store, sorry, mm -hmm. and the Soho store. So um, that lasted until 9-11. And then monies weren't spent, the recession was setting yeah. in, so we closed the store on, um, on Madison Avenue and then wind up closing the store on um, uh, Soho. Mm -hmm. but. After that, it seemed like it fell into place because then I became caregiver for my grandparents and until they passed, and then I became caregiver for my mom until she passed. And uh, we talked off camera, so I know that you believe that every, and I believe it too, everything happens for a reason, and everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. Yeah. And you believe that you were given this quote-unquote time off 
unofficially to do what you needed to do. Yeah, it, I believe wholeheartedly it was God's plan mm -hmm. because my grandparents were uh, from the South and I was still working at uh, the shoe store mm -hmm. and my mom and I arranged for, believe it or not, a doctor to come pay a visit to the house for them because they were in their 90s mm -hmm. and for arrangements to have them picked up to take to their doctors. Well, my grandmother never went to a doctor. She said, if an aspirin don't cure it, it's not going to get cured. <laughs> but my grandfather went to doctors. And so because of that, it just fell into place because he wasn't letting anybody in the house. There, you know, no, mm -hmm. not a stranger wasn't coming into the house. So 9-11 happened, as I said, and then I just um, became their caregiver. Um, it, it was... It just felt okay for me to do that. I really wasn't stressed about it, you know, in the very beginning, because I always felt um, that I have so much to give, like I always wanted to be a mother. Mm -hmm. So I've always had pets, mm -hmm. and I was a mother to my pets. So then I became a mother to my grandparents because I did everything. I washed, I cooked, I cleaned. Um, I took my grandfather to all his doctor's appointments, etc., and did the same for my mother until um, she passed in uh, January 15th. You just recently lost your... Yeah, 2015. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. You have yeah. my condolences. All right, let's, let's, um, let's take it back to where we, to the present. Now we're in 2017. Look yes. at you. You done kicked the door open, and look at what you did. Yes. You didn't open the door for freaking everybody. How does that make you feel? I am humbled and honored by it because this young generation has recognized me as a pioneer, although I paid the price being a pioneer, but they have recognized me for being a pioneer. And now you see them on these same people that you see on TV or the same people that contacted me. Um, um, they're on the, on the covers of Italian Vogue. They're they're in uh, fashion pages, and I, too, have a cover um, for Harper's Bazaar, um, India. I, too, re-signed to be a spokesperson for Clairol See? in 2015. And I did a two-page layout for the um, Harper's Bazaar magazine. So things are definitely moving along. I did um, an audition for a play here in New York. Um, but I'm waiting to hear back from them, so... Oh, you got that, girl. <laughs> you go ahead and claim that. You got that. In God's hand, and on um, the 15th of May, I'm speaking at the U.N. Oh. Well, what are you going to... What, what's the topic, do you know? Um, I'm one of the speakers, and the topic is about my story. Wow. So you get ready to go global with yours. Okay, yeah. okay. Now, you... I, I saw a picture of you at... Uh, was it the... Time 100, did you go to that? I saw a picture of you somewhere at, um, did you? Okay. I was on Out Magazine cover. That's what it is, yeah, that's I what it is. celebrated the 100th anniversary. Uh, in the beginning, I, they weren't gonna give me the cover, but um, they decided that they would and they were gonna break it up because um, uh, Tom Ford had a cover the, celebrating mm -hmm. the 100th. Um, Ellen had her cover. Mm -hmm. I had mine, and then there was a Tony winner from Broadway who had his cover, so they decided to do separate covers, and they gave me a cover. That is, wow. I want a cover. <laughs> Somebody call me. <laughs> this, so, I mean, how do you, how does that make you feel inside that you, ha I mean, look at what you had to go through yeah. to get to where you are, and this, I really think, you're predestined to be who you are. So this was meant for you. Yes. That person only blocked it, just delayed it so that you could take care of your grandma. I'm just gonna put it out there so you could take care of your, your parents and take care of your private stuff. And now you back and it, it's, it's better if, you, if, if from the way I'm looking at it, it's better than it would have been yes. in the 70s. Yes, it's, well it's better because people, people's mindset have changed. Mm -hmm. um, I came from a world of hatred in the 70s and 80s and um, for being gay. And, um, but now it's all, I'm receiving love. And in the beginning, I didn't know how to accept that it. Was, that's what I was gonna ask so you to. So it, it's very humbling. Mm -hmm. It's very humbling. 
and appreciate it. I, I just feel overwhelmed at times, sometimes when I go out, because I'm not used to um, the crowds of um, gathering as they never did before, but now they're doing it now. If I go, you know, to certain functions, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody wants a picture and I deny nobody. Which is how it should be. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I, don't, I, I don't want my name out there with any bad reputation. Yeah. I do. Well, I don't know. I, I don't really care what people say about me anymore. I'm sure they <laughs> talk and I don't really care. But um, that's what I want to ask you. Tracy Africa. Yes. How did you get that name? I got that name because during um, the time that the few years that I was not working, mm -hmm. I um, had no more money. I was totally broke and living under my mother's roof. And so what happened was I was a part of the ball community, mm -hmm. kind of, back in the 70s. And um, I wasn't real well received. Balls were being held in Harlem back then. Yes, I remember. And uh -huh. so... I wasn't well received. I don't know it was a Jersey thing. I, I, just, uh, I just was not well received. So I left the ball community and that's when my fashion uh, world started, mm -hmm. my fashion career started professionally. And so when I came back to the ball community during my time of absence, um, I joined a house and I went to Avis Pendavis's ball. Gosh. <laughs> Because, and then I went for, I always walk for the money prize. So the um, grand prize was $1,000. Mm -hmm. And since the girl was broke, she needed some money. Mm -hmm. So I called up local designers, got a fabulous outfit, did my thing. But I didn't win because I didn't have a clutch. A bag? Yes. And <laughs> this particular person, Avis, always had a bag when she performed. Uh. So being this was her house that was giving it, I didn't have a bag. And I was just representing myself at the time. And that was the, the night that I met the House of Africa who invited me to their meeting, liked me, uh, wanted me to join, and I started representing them as a member. And then the original mother and father didn't want those duties anymore, and I was elected as mother. And so I became mother of the House of Africa. Really? And through the underground scene of the ball community, I became um, very famous in a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they labeled me as an icon now, which is um, quite great. Well deserved. You, you earned that, girl. So. I'm going to stop you right there because we're just about out of time. You know, I could do this all day because I'm fascinated with talking to you about everything that you've gone through. But we're almost out of time. So I'd like to thank my guest, Tracy Gail Norman, for sharing her industry knowledge with us today. Now, before I go, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. I want you to, one, remember that you can't change the game until you first learn the game. Always surround yourself with positive people and positive things. Do what you love and love what you do. And lastly, be who you are, but be who you are tastefully. Always have some class about yourself. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. And if you missed an episode of Model Behavior, now you can catch the previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Just Google Model Behavior with Sharon Quinn and all of the previous episodes will come up. Thanks for watching Model Behavior, and I'll see you guys next week. Class is officially dismissed. Bye, y'all.